He wrote, because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it's at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we're willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And uh, in 1981, as the United States was launching a new crusade for freedom, uh, Samuel Huntington, the professor of government at Harvard, uh, said in a private but published discussion, uh, an interchange, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine. The, uh, the basic uh, problem is this. Uh, the idea is that if you have a society in which the voice of the people is heard, you got to make sure that that voice says the right thing. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You, you got a club in your hand, uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. And in fact, I think you find much more sophisticated concern uh, for thought control precisely as the society becomes more free. According to this alternative view, the media do indeed fulfill a societal purpose, but a very different one. Their societal purpose is to inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. We are privileged to see and hear a presentation by one of America's foremost intellectuals, Noam Chomsky, as he evaluates the American power structure and the mass media, right now on Alternative Views. I've talked to some people who live in other countries who have traveled widely, and they say that Americans are the most heavily indoctrinated and propagandized people that they have ever encountered in their travels. Well, why should this be if this is the land of the free press and democracy? One of America's leading intellectuals, Noam Chomsky, discusses this in his book, which he co-authored, called Manufacturing Consent, and we're very fortunate to have Dr. Chomsky to give us an address on this subject of why Americans are so manipulated and controlled, and how far back in our history this goes. Dr. Chomsky is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, specializing in linguistics. The title, uh, particularly the subtitle, Manufacture of Consent in a democratic society is uh, a bit paradoxical. Uh, manufacture of consent refers to indoctrination, and indoctrination is inconsistent with a democratic society, so you can't have manufacture of consent in a democratic society. Uh, there's, in fact, a standard view on this matter which does make it inconsistent. The standard view is expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell when he speaks of what he calls the societal purpose of the First Amendment, uh, enabling the public to assert meaningful control over uh, the political process. And that's a pretty obvious idea. It, the idea is that a democracy functions to the extent that people have uh, free access to, um, uh, to information and opinion and, of course, the opportunity to act on it. Uh, well, that sounds obvious, in fact, perhaps almost tautological, uh, 
uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view, in fact, a very well-represented contrary view. In fact, the contrary view is probably the dominant view among uh, uh, people who actually have written and thought about uh, the nature of modern democracy. And this contrary view can be traced right back to the origins of modern democracy in the 17th century English Revolution. Uh, as in the case of most revolutions, maybe virtually all, that was a multidimensional affair with a civil war between the supporters of the king and the supporters of parliament, but then a big popular movement was against all of them uh, and didn't want uh, and was trying to and had a very uh, populist, radical, democratic character to it and was defeated. The Democrats were defeated within about 20 years by 1660. And you read their pamphlets, they were saying that we've lost. The only question now is whose slaves the poor shall be, uh, king or parliament. Uh, many revolutions have the same consequence. Uh, maybe all so far, till one yet to come. Uh, uh, in the course of that struggle, there was a great deal of concern over the fact that the general population was gaining the opportunity uh, and the, even the idea of becoming involved directly in shaping their own affairs. Uh, and that led to great concerns. Uh, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen, uh, the spinsters and dairymaids, must be told what to believe. Uh, the greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Uh, one of the contemporary historians, a man named Clement Walker, uh, wrote at the time that uh, the deep concern of the liberal elements we're talking about now over the fact that uh, these guys with their little printing presses putting out pamphlets and, you know, agitating in the army and that sort of thing, uh, were beginning to reveal the mysteries of government. Uh, and he said if they do that, uh, they will make people so curious and arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. That has to be stopped. Uh, and the same idea comes right up to the modern period. Without running through the American Revolution, you can find it and so on. In the modern period, uh, you find major thinkers picking up the same themes. For example, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a much respected moralist and political thinker and very, very influential and among modern political leaders, uh, wrote that rationality belongs to the cool observers. Uh, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And the naive faith of the proletarian requires necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications, which have to be provided by mythmakers to keep the ordinary person on the right course. Uh, Walter Lippmann, who was the dean of American journalists, uh, wrote about what he called the manufacture of consent. That's where that phrase comes from. And he said that the manufacture of consent has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government in a revolution in the practice of democracy. And this, he thought, was appropriate because the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality. That would be Niebuhr's cool observers. Now that was right after World War I, and the timing is important. During World War I, uh, John Dewey's circle of liberal intellectuals uh, were extremely impressed with, uh, in their words, in their perception, with having imposed their will upon a reluctant and indifferent majority uh, with the aid of propaganda fabrications about Hun atrocities and jingoistic uh, oversimplifications. The point was that, as usual, the population was pacifistic and didn't want to go to war. Didn't see any point in it. In fact, Woodrow Wilson won the 1916 election uh, on the slogan, uh, Peace Without Victory, uh, a mandate which he predictably interpreted as meaning victory without peace very quickly. Uh, and uh, with the aid of the intellectuals, they felt at least, maybe they were exaggerating their own contribution, that they had whipped the population into a war fever. Uh, and, uh, American uh, historians also joined enthusiastically in the cause. Uh, they formed the National Board for Historical Service. Uh, the founder of it 
uh, said that what was needed was what he called historical engineering, uh, a method to serve the state by explaining the issues of the war so that we might better win it. Uh, the Wilson administration established the first official government propaganda agency uh, in the United States called the Creel Commission, Commission on Public Information, which was a straight propaganda agency to try to uh, turn this reluctant and indifferent majority uh, into a willingness to uh, fight the war and succumb to jingoistic uh, fanaticism. That's actually a predecessor of a much more ambitious program uh, developed during the Reagan administration, uh, the Reagan's Office of Latin American Public Diplomacy, theoretically under the State Department, but actually apparently run by the National Security Council. Uh, that was an illegal operation, uh, as the Congressional General Accounting Office later concluded in a study of it, a legal operation which had the intent of intimidating critics and uh, controlling a debate and discussion over Central America. Its goals, as they put it, were to demonize the Sandinistas uh, and, of course, to uh, build up support for the U.S. client states, the U.S. terror states in the region. Now, that was exposed during the Iran-Contra hearings by one of the very few journalists who actually uh, did some work on the hearings, did some journalistic work instead of just repeating the handouts. Uh, Alfonso Chardy of the Miami Herald exposed this, and when he exposed, began, exposed later came out a lot more details in congressional hearings. Uh, when he exposed it, he went to high administration officials to, who, to ask them to talk about it, and they described the, these propaganda efforts as a spectacular success. Uh, one of them described the efforts as the kind of operation that you would carry out in enemy territory. That's a very evocative phrase, and it expresses the attitude of the Reaganite uh, uh, political leaders and, in fact, of state leaders generally towards their own populations. They're an enemy. It's the domestic enemy that you have to control and marginalize. And you want to make sure that they don't become so curious and arrogant that they won't find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. Uh, the, uh, out of the uh, Creel Commission, but going back to World War I, there were a number of consequences. One of the members of the Creel Commission was a man who went on to become the leading figure and sort of patron saint of the modern public relations industry, uh, Edward Bernays. Uh, he later wrote about what he called the engineering of consent, which he said was the essence of democracy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and the public relations industry is devoted, in the words of its own, to major industry, that, which was devoted to controlling what they call the public mind uh, educating the American people about the economic facts of life to ensure a favorable climate for business and a proper understanding of the common interests. Uh, the public mind, uh, one AT&T executive observed 80 years ago, the public mind is the only serious danger facing the company, and it's got to be controlled. Uh, Edward Bernays went on uh, to carry out such operations as demonizing the democratic capitalist government of Guatemala working for the United Fruit Company when the United States was planning to overthrow it, as it did in 1954, turning the country into a charnel house, which has remained ever since. Uh, there's also an academic twist to all of this. In fact, it's a major theme in the academic social sciences. Uh, going back at least 50 years or more, one of the most prominent modern American political scientists, Harold Laswell, who's a leading figure in uh, communications and such things. Uh, he wrote the article on propaganda in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, which was published in 1933. Uh, and in it, he says that we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not. Uh, the best judges are the elites, us smart guys, the cool observers. And we must therefore be ensured the means to impose our will for the common good, of course. This, he said, will require a whole tech new technique of control, largely through propaganda, because of the ignorance and superstition of the masses. Same theme all the way through. Uh, the basic problem is this. Uh, the idea is that if you have a society in which the voice of the people is heard, you've got to make sure that that voice says the right thing. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You've you got a club in your hand, 
uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. And in fact, I think you find much more sophisticated concern uh, for thought control precisely as the society becomes more free. I don't think it's surprising that the sophisticated discussion, uh, things like the public relations industry and uh, the academic uh, side of it and you know, the journalistic side and all these kinds of things I've been sampling, uh, I suspect if one did a comparative study, you'd find that they develop primarily in relatively free societies. Uh, ours is a very free society in the sense that the state has, by comparative standards, very limited resources to control by force. And I think it's undoubtedly, in fact, the most sophisticated in the terms of, in the reliance on techniques of indoctrination and control, public relations industry in particular as a, an American creation. Uh, you'll notice, of course, the close similarity to Leninist ideology, to Bolshevism, which also assumes that the radical intellectuals uh, are the specialized class, the vanguard, and they've got to lead the stupid and ignorant masses to a better society. In fact, the two conceptions are very much alike. Uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons why there's been historically such an easy transition from one to another. The move from being a Leninist enthusiast to a, uh, you know, a passionate supporter of uh, uh, state capitalism and you know, working for American aims, that takes place overnight. It's been going on for years. Uh, it's called the God that failed transition. Uh, and it happens very simply. I mean, in the early stages, it had some authenticity to it when people like Ignazio Salone and others were making this transition. But in recent years, it's become just a farce, I mean, technique of opportunism. Uh, and the transition is very easy, I think, because there isn't much of a difference in ideological change. Uh, it's just a matter of where you think power lies. If you think there's going to be a popular revolution, and you can ride that revolution to state power and then wield the whip over the masses, you're a Leninist enthusiast. If you see that that's not going to happen and power lies in the state capitalist institutions which you have to serve as a manager, an ideological manager, you do that. But it's basically a very similar position. And in fact, uh, in the last century or so, since there's been a more or less identifiable secular intelligentsia, uh, I think you find typically that they fall into one or the other of these two categories. They uh, associate themselves with one or the other system of power and hierarchy uh, and uh, subordination. Uh, in fact, what I just said is almost a tautology. It's only if you submit to those systems that you're counted as a respectable intellectual uh, for obvious reasons. Well, coming up to more modern times in the post-Second World War period, uh, you find, again, a deep concern over the need to control and deceive the public, to control the public mind. Uh, presidential historian Thomas Bailey wrote in 1948, at the time when we were sort of setting off on a new war, the Cold War, he wrote, because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it's at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we're willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And uh, in 1981, as the United States was launching a new crusade for freedom, uh, Samuel Huntington, the professor of government at Harvard, uh, said in a private but published discussion, uh, interchange, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine, which is quite accurate and gives a certain insight into the nature of the Cold War, in particular into the nature of the war against Nicaragua, which is what he specifically had in mind. Well, these concerns over uh, controlling the public mind tend to rise to the surface, particularly uh, after periods of wars and turmoil, like the 17th century revolution, the Civil War, or like the First World War, when Woodrow Wilson launched the major Red Scare, which is the major example in modern American history, of all of American history of state repression. That was really large-scale and effective. 
in destroying unions and uh, uh, destroying independent politics and uh, eliminating independent thought and so on. And the same thing happened after World War II uh, with the uh, phenomenon that's uh, mislabeled McCarthyism. It's mislabeled because it was actually initiated by the liberal Democrats in the late 1940s. McCarthy just came along at the tail end of it and vulgarized it a little. Uh, the reason for this is, an, uh, is that uh, periods of wars and turmoil have a tendency to uh, arouse people from apathy and to make them think and to make them organize often. So that's why you get things like the Red Scare and McCarthyism uh, right after periods of war and turmoil. And the same thing happened after the Vietnam War, which had the same effect. Uh, after the Vietnam War, uh, elites were concerned about what they called a crisis of democracy. In fact, one of the most interesting books on this topic, or one of the most interesting books on, most of the insightful books, I think, on modern, uh, on the modern democratic system, is called The Crisis of Democracy. It's a study, the only book-length study, published by the Trilateral Commission. Uh, it's an important group put together by David Rockefeller in 1973, and it represents the more or less liberal internationalists from the three major centers of modern capitalism, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan, hence trilateral. And remember, this is the liberals. This is the group out of which uh, Jimmy Carter and most of his administration came. Uh, the cri what's the crisis of democracy that they're concerned with in all of the democratic societies? Well, the crisis is that uh, during the 1960s, uh, large groups of people who are normally passive and apathetic began to try to enter the political arena to press their demands. Uh, and that's a crisis uh, which has to be overcome. The, the naive might call that democracy, but that's because they don't understand. The sophisticated understand that that's a crisis of democracy. Uh, the American spokesman, again, Samuel Huntington, uh, wrote in his report that uh, Harry Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. In those days, there was no crisis of democracy. Things were working just right. But in the 1960s, you got all this turmoil. I mean, uh, young people and women and you know, uh, uh, labor. I mean, all kinds of weird people who were supposed to be sitting quietly in the corners uh, began to get involved and caused this crisis. I mean, the same crisis that arose in the 17th century and that repeatedly arises uh, when people begin to try to take advantage of the uh, uh, formal opportunities that exist. Uh, among the terrible things that were happening during the 60s causing this crisis, they said, was that you had this group of people who they called value-oriented intellectuals. Uh, people who are concerned with things like truth and justice and all that sort of nonsense, uh, and they're opposed to the good guys, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals, they called them the commissars, the ones who just do the job, you know. Uh, but you had these value-oriented intellectuals, and they were doing all sorts of horrible things like uh, undermine, delegitimizing the institutions that are responsible for the indoctrination of the young, like schools and universities. Remember, this is an internal discussion, so they kind of let their hair down. Uh, their general proposal at the end of all of this, these lengthy and thoughtful discussions was that what we need is more moderation in democracy to mitigate the excess of democracy and to overcome the crisis. Uh, in plain terms, what that means is that the public has to be reduced to their proper state of apathy and obedience and driven from the public arena if democracy is to survive in the appropriate sense with the specialized class, you know, the cool observers, us smart guys, uh, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals doing our job in the interests of the people who have real power. Uh, that's the liberal side. I won't go into what the reactionary side says about the matter. Well, uh, to summarize, uh, there is a standard view of democracy. Uh, it's the view of Justice Powell. The public should assert, or the view that he expressed at least, the, the view that the public ought to assert meaningful control over the political process. And there's a contrary view. The contrary view is the public's a dangerous enemy, and it has to be controlled for its own good, of course, the way you control children, like you don't let a three-year-old run across the street. Uh, the first view uh, is the rhetorical view now, the second view is the view that's actually held, uh, and you can see that it's actually held when a crisis of democracy erupts and the unwashed masses uh, 
uh, begin to try to enter into the political arena and have to be somehow repressed, either by force, as in the Red Scare, or by other means, uh, uh, in order to overcome the crisis of democracy. Well, with regard uh, to the, the media play a big role in this, and with regard to the media too, there is a standard view. Uh, the standard view, for example, is expressed again by Justice Powell in the same discussion when he claims that it's the crucial role of the media to affect the societal purpose of the First Amendment, that is to it, allow the public to assert control of the political process. Standard view was also expressed by Judge Gerfine in an important decision, uh, the Pentagon Papers decision, when he permitted the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers. And he said, we have a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press, and it must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. Uh, that's one view, that's the standard view. And given that view, we then have a debate. The debate is, uh, is over, whether the, over whether the media have gone too far in their defiance of authority and their adversarial stance. Now, uh, the right wing claims they've gone too far. They're overcome by a liberal bias. We've got to do something about it. Uh, the liberals, as in the Trilateral Commission, uh, all, in fact, agree. Uh, they, in the same study, they say that the media threaten government authority by their adversarial stance, and they've got to be curbed. If they can't curb themselves, the government is going to have to move in to curb them. Curb them. Uh, the executive director of Freedom House, Leonard Sussman, uh, asked whether free institutions must be uh, must free institutions be overthrown by the very freedom they sustain. Rhetorical question, meaning we got to do something about uh, this excess uh, uh, freedom that the press is using to attack the government. He was writing about the uh, a Freedom House study of the coverage of the Tet Offensive, which became a sort of a classic, uh, allegedly showing that uh, uh, the press lost the war in Vietnam by uh, unfair criticism of the government during the Tet Offensive. It's an interesting, if there's no time to talk about it, I may try to get back to it. If not, maybe get to it in discussion. Very interesting study. It was total fraud. Uh, falsified the data, you know, the whole thing was faked. When you actually correct the errors, uh, it turns out that the press, that the real charge of Freedom House was that the press, although completely supportive of the government policy and working completely within the framework of government propaganda, nevertheless was too pessimistic, they said. Uh, they didn't tell you by what standards it was too pessimistic. The obvious standard is to compare it with, say, internal U.S. intelligence assessments, which we have thanks to the Pentagon Papers, and it turns out the press was more optimistic than U.S. intelligence because they were believing the public statements and they didn't know about the private statements. Uh, so Freedom House's complaint reduces to the fact that the press uh, though, prop, though su totally supportive of the propaganda, didn't do it in an upbeat enough fashion. I wouldn't have surprised George Orwell that that should be the criticism of the press produced by an organization called Freedom House. Uh, but that's become, the, uh, uh, that's become the standard since everyone refers to that as the study that proves that the press was too adversarial. Well, uh, that's the debate. Uh, then, then the defenders of the press say, no, we're not too adversarial, maybe we are too adversarial, but uh, you've got to tolerate us even though we're cantankerous and so on. That's essentially the issue. Well, outside of that debate between those who say the press is too adversarial and must be curbed and those who say, well, yes, the press is cantankerous and impossible, but we just have to suffer that in the interest of freedom, uh, outside the spectrum of that debate, which constitutes virtually the entire mainstream discussion, virtually the entire discussion. But outside the debate, there is another position. Uh, the other position challenges the factual assumption that's taken for granted in the debate. According to this alternative view, the media do indeed fulfill a societal purpose, but a very different one. Their societal purpose is to inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. And they do this in all sorts of ways. They do it by selection of topics, by distribution of concern, by the way they frame issues, by filtering of information, uh, by emphasis and tone, by simple fabrication sometimes, but crucially by the bounding of debate to make sure that it doesn't go outside of certain limits. Uh, 
uh, the bounding both in the news columns and in the opinion columns, because, of course, the news columns themselves embody all sorts of assumptions and ideological presuppositions and so on. Uh, to the ex according to this alternative view, to the extent that there is a liberal bias, uh, it serves primarily to bound thinkable thought, uh, that is, to instill the unchallengeable assumptions, uh, which in fact reflect this rather narrow elite consensus. So the liberal bias performs a real function. It says, thus far and no further. I'm as far as you can go, and I go as far, how, I, how far I go is still accepting the basic presuppositions as unchallengeable. Now, within those bounds, there's ample controversy, uh, and it reflects the tactical divisions uh, among elites over how to achieve generally shared aims, uh, but these limits are very rarely transcended. So the media thus function in accordance with what uh, my co-author Edward Herman and I have called a propaganda model in a recent book. Uh, that's another view. Well, uh, the, prop the propaganda model has a lot of predictions. It has a lot of predictions about how the press is going to behave, but it also has a further prediction. Uh, the further prediction is that no matter how well confirmed the propaganda model is, it cannot be taken seriously and therefore must be effectively excluded from mainstream discussion. And that actually follows from the model itself. The reason is that the model, if you think it through, the model uh, rejects certain principles that are serviceable to power. That is, it falls outside the spectrum uh, defined by the presupposition that the media are adversarial and cantankerous, perhaps excessively so. Now, that presupposition is a useful one. It's serviceable to the interests of established institutions to believe that what you're reading is actually criticism if it's in fact support. That's a technique, it's a sophisticated technique of indoctrination. Uh, and of course, it's very serviceable to the media themselves. It's nice to think that you're, a, you know, pride yourself on being an independent and courageous uh, uh, adversary of power. And since those assumptions are serviceable, they're going to be upheld according to the propaganda model. And no serious challenge will be permitted. So uh, that prediction, indeed, is very readily confirmed. The propaganda model is never taken seriously. It can't be considered. Uh, notice that the propaganda model has a rather disconcerting feature to it. Uh, plainly, as a matter of logic, it's either valid or invalid. Uh, if it's invalid, you can dismiss it. If it's valid, you must dismiss it because it's saying the wrong thing. So one way or another, it's got to be dismissed uh, by its very nature. Uh, and uh, notice that truth is no defense. Uh, it's very much like the traditional doctrine of seditious libel, uh, the doctrine that it's, you can't, it's libelous, it's a crime to criticize state authorities because uh, that undermines power. It's a doctrine that runs up to pretty modern times. Uh, and truth was never a defense against seditious libel. In fact, truth simply heightened the enormous, enormity of the crime of uh, calling authority into disrepute. And the same is true here. Well, of course, the basic, the basic uh, questions are factual. Uh, are the standard assumptions correct? That is, is it true that the press is independent, cantankerous, adversarial, maybe excessively so? Or are the assumptions of the propaganda model correct? That's a factual question. Uh, and that's the main topic, but I'm barely going to be able to get into it. Uh, but before, though I won't try to really, you know, no, no hope in a few minutes of providing real evidence one way or another, uh, let me just talk a little bit about the, the way you would deal with this problem, some methodological questions. Uh, first, notice three comments. One, the propaganda model has a certain prior plausibility to it. That is, if you'd simply accept uncontroversial free market assumptions, quite uncontroversial assumptions about how society works, you're led almost automatically to the propaganda model. Uh, you can see that pretty simply simply ask yourself what the media are. Now, notice here I'm talking about what some might call the agenda-setting media, the media that set the frame that others adapt to. And that's a pretty narrow group. It's primarily the New York Times and the Washington Post and the three television channels and a couple of others. It's not much else. Those set the framework that everyone else pretty well adapts to uh, within anything like the mainstream. So we're talking about the agenda-setting media and ask yourself what they are. Well, what they are is very large corporations. Uh, in fact, they're integrated with, uh, often owned by even larger conglomerates. 
Now, like other businesses, they have a product that they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, other businesses, and the product is audiences. Uh, the media don't finance themselves on their audiences. In fact, the audiences are usually a loss. The more you subscribe, the more the newspaper loses money. And of course, the television set, you know, they make anything when you turn it on. Uh, they make their money from advertisers. Advertising rates go up if you have a, the right kind of audience. Incidentally, a relatively privileged audience raises advertising rates. Uh, so what the media are, just as an institution, is major corporations selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what would you expect to come out of such a system? You'd expect to come out something that reflects the interests of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. That uh, wouldn't be very surprising. In fact, it would be amazing if it weren't true. Uh, quite apart from that, there are many other things pressing in the same direction. There are, after all, centers of power in the society, I mean, the state, you know, the corporate sector, and others, and they can impose punishments for if things go wrong and re offer rewards if things go right. You gain by adapting to them. It's less costly uh, uh, and so on. Furthermore, the top managerial positions in the uh, media, uh, editors and columnists and so on, uh, if you make it into those positions, you're part of the privileged elite, part of the very top, in fact. Uh, uh, the, that's where your associations are and your perceptions and your friends and the people you play golf with and everything else. And it wouldn't be very surprising, again, if you reflected the same interests. Uh, and it goes on. If you think through, uh, we discuss this in our book a lot, but if you think through it, there are just many pressures uh, which lead immediately to the assumption that the propaganda model is highly plausible, even without any evidence. It's at least, it's got prior plausibility. In fact, it would be rather surprising if it weren't true on uncontroversial assumptions. That's point one. Point two is it has a lot of elite advocacy. That's what I started with, pointing out that it represents a position that intellectual elites have thought the media ought to serve, and the whole system of education and so on ought to serve. Uh, that's the position since the 17th century, probably the dominant position. It's necessary to manufacture consent for the general good because of the stupidity of the average man and so on. We have to put aside these democratic dogmatisms. So we have a position that has prior plausibility and elite advocacy. And a third point is it's generally accepted by the public. It's very striking that the debate over the media is determined by the intellectuals. And they're the most indoctrinated sector of the society. And for them, the only debate is over whether uh, the media are too adversarial or not. But there are polls. You ask the public, what do you think about the media? And the poll public generally thinks the media are too conformist and too subordinate to power. In other words, they automatically accept something like the propaganda model. So here we have three facts, a position that has prior plausibility, uh, elite advocacy, and rather general public support. Well, that doesn't prove that it's valid, of course, but it does suggest that it ought to be part of the discussion. Uh, it's not part of the discussion, exactly as the model predicts. Now, by now, turning to the factual matter, there are by now thousands of pages of documentation, detailed, close documentation, uh, on the propaganda model. And uh, it's been tested in just about every conceivable way, subjected to the harshest tests we can think of. I think by now it's one of the best confirmed uh, uh, theses of the social sciences. Uh, th if there's any serious challenge to it, I've never seen it. It's generally just ignored or else caricatured. Uh, so what you have is this very well-confirmed thesis, not proven, uh, very well-confirmed thesis, no serious challenge to it, to my knowledge. It has prior plausibility. The model's plausible on uncontroversial assumptions, advocated by elites, generally supported by the public, but it's not part of the discussion, exactly in accord with its predictions off the agenda. Well, the next task, and the interesting one, would be to look at uh, actual details. As I say, there's plenty of things you can look at in print, indeed thousands of pages and more coming out, uh, and I'm not going to, I almost hesitate to give examples because they're misleading. Uh, any set of examples will be misleading because I think its predictions are essentially universally confirmed with only statistical error. So giving examples is misleading because you might argue plausibly that the examples are not properly selected. That'd be a reasonable response, and that's why you have to look at a range of tests to make sure they are properly selected, like let the people who think that the media are adversarial pick their own grounds. That's the harshest test that the model can 
face. So let them pick the grounds. Well, they've picked their grounds, things like the coverage of the Tet Offensive and so on. And it turns out that everything you go to, Tet Offensive, Watergate, Iran-Contra hearings, you take a look at them, it, they show precisely the subser subservience of the press to established power. Uh, uh, compare paired historical examples. I mean, history doesn't run controlled experiments, but it runs things that are reasonably close. Uh, for example, you can find similar times and similar periods when uh, uh, that you can find atrocities of roughly the same scale carried out by official enemies or by ourselves and our clients and look at the comparative coverage or good deeds like elections carried out by our clients and our enemies and look at the comparative coverage. Uh, all of these tests and in fact every other one I've ever been able, we've ever been able to concoct leads to the same conclusion. The propaganda model is quite valid as a very good first approximation to the way the media function. Uh, just to give a few examples, and I stress again they're misleading because they're few, uh, take say the question of freedom of press. That's a picket because it's obviously a matter that the press is naturally much concerned about. And in fact, uh, the press has been very much concerned about freedom of the press in the last decade, let's just keep to the last decade. Uh, in the last decade, there's been plenty of material in the press about freedom of the press, uh, mainly in Latin America. And uh, ask your friends to name one newspaper in Latin America that uh, has raised freedom of press issues. Uh, which newspaper in Latin America has been suppressed unfairly by uh, a state and therefore we have to defend it? Well, you know, 99 people out of 100 will name La Prensa in Nicaragua. Uh, and the reason they'll name it is because there's been massive coverage of the tribulations of La Prensa in Nicaragua. Uh, there was a study by, in Harper's Magazine by Francisco Goldman, a media analyst, who found uh, that the New York Times alone was giving um, like something like five references a month. That's more than one a week to the tribulations of La Prensa in Nicaragua. That's probably more coverage than all freedom of the press issues throughout the rest of the world combined. Probably much more, in fact. Well, that's an interesting choice. Uh, uh, we can take a look at it. Uh, not, not only coverage, but also um, enthusiastic uh, support. I mean, the, for example, in, in 1986, in June 1986, there was an interesting series of events. Uh, the World Court condemned the United States for its unlawful use of force and violation of treaties uh, in its war against Nicaragua and called upon the United States to desist from these crimes. Congress responded to this by uh, voting $100 million in aid to increase, to accelerate the unlawful use of force. Uh, the Reagan administration announced that this is for real, this is a real war. Uh, and there was enthusiastic coverage of that. The World Court decision was simply dismissed as an annoying bit of nonsense, uh, either ignored or falsified, but anyway dismissed. It's the court that was the criminal, not the United States. Uh, the, uh, in response to this uh, virtual declaration of war, as the Reagan administration described it, the Nicaraguan government suspended La Prensa. And that led to virtual hysteria in the United States. The uh, Neiman Fellows, the journalism fellows at Harvard, uh, off immediately gave the owner of La Prensa, Violeta Chamorro, a, an award. Uh, the Washington Post had a big editorial saying she deserves 10 awards. You know, uh, it's a newspaper of valor. That was the head of the, that was the heading. The Murray Kempton, the left liberal columnist in the New York Review. Uh, issued a plea to people to provide funds for La Prensa to keep its equipment going, that those funds could be added to the rather substantial CIA uh, subvention to La Prensa ever since 1979, uh, and on and on. Uh, well, uh, what is La Prensa? Uh, La Prensa is an interesting newspaper. It's probably unique in history. Uh, it's often believed that La Prensa is the newspaper that courageously opposed this, the Somoza dictatorship. And if you read the press, that's what you would believe. Well, it does have the same name as that newspaper, but that's about where it ends. Uh, in uh, 1980, the, uh, right after the Sandinista Revolution, the owners of La Prensa uh, fired the editor and 80% uh, of the staff left with him uh, because the staff and the editor refused to support their uh, pro-contra policy. 
Now, the editor and the staff formed another newspaper on the way of the audio, uh, and if a newspaper is constituted of its editor and its staff, that's the old La Prensa. If a newspaper is constituted of the money that's behind it, well, of course, the new La Prensa is the old La Prensa. So you just decide how to decide now what a newspaper is. Is it the staff and the editor, or is it the owners and the equipment? Uh, this you'll never read about, but it's a fact. Now, the new La Prensa, uh, supports the overthrow of the government by a foreign power and does it quite openly, and it's funded by the foreign power that is trying to overthrow the government. Now, that's pretty unusual. In fact, I can't think of any remote parallel in the history of the Western democracies. So, for example, during the Second World War, uh, England did not permit Nazi Germany to, put, to fund and run a major newspaper in London, and the United States did not permit Japan, say, uh, to dominate... Uh, you know, to, to invest in and run a major newspaper coming out of New York. In fact, uh, we don't have to go that far. Uh, England and the United States imposed harsh censorship. Uh, they wouldn't even let tiny little uh, uh, dissident newspapers go through the mails or appear and, and so on. Uh, there's, no there's no remote parallel in Western history to this as far as I can see. Uh, this, incidentally, is never mentioned in media commentary. Well, nevertheless, a true civil libertarian will defend La Prensa from harassment, even though this is unique in human history, this fact. Because if you're a real civil libertarian, uh, you think that uh, the United States should have allowed Japan and Germany to dominate the American media during the Second World War, if you're a real civil libertarian. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we now, ask, we now, we now turn, make the obvious question. I mean, we ask whether the uh, you know, the great excitement, the uh, virtual hysteria of American intellectuals over La Prensa is, reflects their libertarian passions uh, or, whether it's because they believe, uh, or whether it's because they're serving power, as a propaganda model predicts. That's a fair question, and there's a test. There's an obvious test, and we all know how to apply it. It's a test that we apply all the time when we look at our enemies. So, for example, suppose you take a look at the productions of the um, East German... Uh, peace group or the World Peace Council, which is sort of a communist front organization. You read their publicity their, and you'll see that they have a lot of criticisms of the United States, often very valid criticisms. Uh, in fact, their critical discussion of repression in the United States and in U.S. Uh, dependencies not only is often valid, but it's often the kind of thing that's not reported here. Well, do we honor them for that? No, of course not. We regard them with contempt. And the reason is by, because we apply a very simple and obvious test. We ask, what do they say about the repression and atrocities for which they're responsible? What do they say about Soviet repression and atrocities? And as soon as we find out the answer to that question, we just simply dismiss them with contempt, rightly. Uh, uh, you begin by talking about your own responsibility, and then sort of, you know, on a footnote somewhere, you can talk about the bad things done by other guys, at least if you regard yourself as a moral agent, you know, as somebody worthy of minimal respect and attention. Uh, we understand that in the case of our enemies, and we might have enough honesty to apply the same test to ourselves, so let's try it. Uh, we can now apply the test. We have this tremendous libertarian passion over La Prensa, the first newspaper in history, uh, to be funded by a foreign power calling for the overthrow of the government uh, uh, in which it appears, in which it's published. And remember, this is not a major power. It's not like the United States, which was never under threat during the Second World War. This is a poor third world country, which is barely able to survive the attack of the superpower. So we, we have that, and we can ask how the same press has reacted uh, to other examples of repression during the same period, in fact, in the same area. Well, there are test cases, so let's try a few. Uh, let's take El Salvador, right n nearby, except the U.S. client. Uh, there once was an independent press in El Salvador, two small newspapers, uh, La Cronica and El Independiente, two small newspapers. They were not supported by a foreign power trying to overthrow the government. They were not particularly left-wing. Uh, they were independent, run by businessmen. They sort of challenged the distribution of power. You know, they said maybe we should have some land reform or something like that. Well, they're not around anymore. Uh, they're not around because the government that we arm, fund, train, and support uh, sent its security forces to destroy them. Uh, one newspaper was eliminated by the simple device of uh, taking an editor and a photojournalist who were in a San Salvador restaurant, taking them out, security forces went in, took them outside, cut them to pieces with machetes, and left them in a ditch. At that point, the owner fled, and that took care of one newspaper. 
Uh, the second newspaper took a little harder. It took uh, several bombings, uh, th three assassination attempts on the editor. Uh, finally, the army uh, surrounded the premises with tanks and uh, then broke in and smashed the place up and destroyed it. They had previously a machine gunning attack. It killed a newsboy. At that point, the editor fled. That took care of the second newspaper. Uh, well, that was uh, eight years ago. Uh, so we can now ask, uh, how much attention did that receive? That's an example of a violation of freedom of the press, a little more severe than the uh, harassment of La Prensa. Uh, well, there's an answer to that. You can check the New York Times, for example. It has never received one word of mention in the New York Times news columns. It has never received one editorial mention uh, in all of these years. And the same is true of the other media. It simply doesn't matter. These are atrocities committed by our clients, uh, the guys we pay and train to do that sort of thing. Uh, so all of a sudden, our concern for freedom of the press disappears. Uh, or let's take another U.S. client, in fact, the major U.S. client, Israel, which receives by far the major U.S. aid, and is again not a small country under attack by a superpower. Uh, well, uh, here, here too, history has set up some interesting tests. Uh, the same, at exactly the same time that Nicaragua suspended La Prensa, after uh, the virtual declaration of war uh, in violation of the world court proceedings. At the very same time, Israel closed down, closed down permanently two Jerusalem newspapers, Arab newspapers, of course, closed down two Jerusalem newspapers uh, on the charge that uh, the security forces had claimed that they were supported by a terrorist group, by a hostile group. Well, that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court judged that that was legitimate because, in it, as it explained in its judgment, uh, no state will ever permit uh, no, a business, no matter how legitimate it is, that's supported by hostile elements. Uh, and although we have freedom of speech in Israel, it does not extend to uh, activities that might threaten the security of the state. Uh, well, how much cover that's much more severe than what happened in the La Prensa case, so how much coverage did that get? Well, actually, that did get one mention in the U.S. press, uh, it was mentioned in a letter of mine in the Boston Globe commenting on the hypocrisy of the Neiman Fellows. Uh, notice that the, they did not give a prize to these editors. In fact, that was never even reported. Uh, after the Central America Peace Accords, um, La Prensa was opened. Uh, the week right at the time it was opened, uh, Israel closed a Nazareth newspaper that's inside Israel, closed a Nazareth newspaper permanently on grounds that it uh, had, uh, it was supported again by hostile elements. The editor again went to the Supreme Court, uh, pleaded that everything that appeared in the newspaper passed through censorship. That was disregarded on the grounds that uh, if the state says it's supported by hostile elements, that's all that's required. You never need any evidence when the state comes along and says security reasons. The courts just accept it. Uh, they also closed a, a news office in Nablus on the grounds that uh, the editor, who had already been in, who was already in jail, in fact, he was in jail for having alleged, not without charge, without legal charge, on the claim that he had contact with hostile elements. Uh, his wife had been running the newspapers, claimed that she'd maintained those contacts. So they closed the press office. Well, how much coverage did that get in the, in the U.S. press? Answer, as far as I can find, zero uh, in both cases. Well, I could, here's, two, here's some real controlled experiments that history was kind enough to set up for us. I picked the week of the suspension of La Prensa and the week of the opening of La Prensa. I picked a case in El Salvador. Just to round it off, let's take our other client state, Guatemala, and let's come up to more recent times. Uh, Guatemala, uh, we, the United States enthusiastically supported a vast outbreak of terror and violence in Guatemala in the early 80s. Uh, the Reaganites were positively uh, passionate in their enthusiasm for this. Uh, maybe 100,000 people were slaughtered, something like that. Uh, maybe something roughly of that neighborhood. However, after a uh, sufficient massacre had been carried out, uh, they had uh, what's called a democratic election, uh, and uh, uh, there's supposed to be a democracy in Guatemala. That's what they tell us. Well, one of the pe during this uh, uh, period of U.S.-backed slaughter, uh, they didn't have any censorship. Uh, it, the problems of the press were taken care of simply by murdering journalists. About 50 journalists were murdered, uh, including, you know, television journalists right in the middle of broadcasts and so on. And for some reason, you didn't need any censorship when that was going on. In fact, that was never barely discussed. You'll find bare mention of it in the press. Well, after the return of democracy, which we pride ourselves on, 
uh, one of the editors who had fled and was living in Mexico decided to return and he opened a small newspaper about a year ago last February called La Epoca. Again, it wasn't calling for the overthrow of the government, it wasn't supported by a foreign power, it was just a kind of a left liberal journal, small left liberal journal. When he came back to uh, Guatemala, uh, there were immediately death threats from the uh, death squads, which are just adjuncts to the security forces, uh, warning him that he was either going to be killed or flee. He wasn't going to allow to run that newspaper. He nevertheless went ahead and the newspaper published a couple of issues. Uh, and uh, then uh, in July, uh, 15 armed men broke into the offices, firebombed them, kidnapped the night watchman, uh, and destroyed the premises. Uh, the next day, the editor, Brian Barrera, held a press conference to which no one came, except some people from the European press, uh, and said that plainly there's no possibility for free expression in Guatemala. Uh, he then received another death threat warning him he better get out of the country, he'd be killed. Uh, he was taken to the airport by a European ambassador to make sure that he could get out alive, uh, and he fled back to Mexico. Well, how much coverage did that get? Answer, zero. Nothing in the New York Times, nothing in the Washington Post. That's just last year. Now, it's not that they didn't know about it. We know perfectly well that they knew about it. Uh, first of all, because it was on the international, it was on the wires and so on and so forth, but also because they themselves referred to it obliquely later. Uh, about a month later, there was an article in the New York Times on some cultural conference in Guatemala back in the arts pages, uh, and the uh, uh, correspondent who went there had some remark buried in there about uh, 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 La Epoca. The tr point is it just doesn't matter. I mean, that's, uh, it's not just harassment and suppression, it's it's, you know, destruction and physical destruction and murder, but it's carried out by our clients, so it doesn't matter. Well, those are the kinds of things you find when you look. That's the end of this Alternative Views, but Noam Chomsky will be back next time, and he'll conclude his speech and take questions from the audience. We'd like to thank Paul Lukowski and Jim Dickerson, who provided us with a tape of the speech of Noam Chomsky as it was recorded in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And also, Laura... During the 1980s, the Reagan administration is responsible for roughly 200,000 people slaughtered. And that doesn't mean just killed. You know, that means tortured and mutilated and raped, I mean, Pol Pot-style torture. That's pretty serious business. Hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of refugees, large areas of the country destroyed. All of this in an effort to block social reform. The Republicans attacked uh, Dukakis as a card-carrying member of the ACLU. That's a very interesting phrase. That means an organ, uh, card-carrying, of course, means real, really com communist. You know, that's what it's supposed to imply. Uh, so here's an organization that's committed to defense of the Constitution. And according to the Republicans, uh, that's communist. Well, you know, I think that characterizes modern conservatism. It's really a profoundly reactionary movement which is deeply opposed to the values that, on which the country was established. I quoted the uh, Trilateral Commission view of the educational system, uh, namely it's a system of indoctrination of the young. And I think that's correct. It's a system of indoctrination of the young. That was the way the liberal elites regard it, and they're more or less accurate. Uh, so the educational system is supposed to train people to be uh, obedient, conformist, uh, not think too much, uh, do what you're told, stay passive, don't cause any crises of democracy, don't raise any questions, and so on. That's basically what the, what the uh, system is about. Noam Chomsky concludes his two-part series analyzing the mass media and American society, right now on Alternative Views.
This will be the concluding section of our two-part series featuring Dr. Noam Chomsky from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of America's foremost critics of the mass media and American society. Noam Chomsky is co-author of a very good book on the mass media called Manufacturing Consent. In this program, he will mainly take questions from the audience. We also will present some information from the Progressive Magazine on mass media distortions. And now here is Noam Chomsky speaking from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. In political discourse, every term has two meanings. You've got to start by recognizing that. So democracy has an official meaning, which is something like, you know, the ability of the public to take part in running their own affairs or something. But it also has a technical meaning, the one that's actually used. Uh, something is a democracy if it's run by the business classes. If, if business runs it, especially business elements that are supportive of U.S. interests, then it's a democracy. If not, it's not a democracy. It doesn't matter. Nothing else matters virtually. Uh, you'll check, you'll notice that this criterion works quite perfectly for identifying democracy. Uh, same is true of the term peace process. It has a dictionary meaning. In the dictionary meaning, a peace process is some kind of process that's trying to lead towards peace. But it also has a technical meaning. Uh, the technical meaning, in its technical meaning, it refers to whatever the United States happens to be advocating at a particular moment. Uh, uh, whatever diplomatic initiatives the United States is advocating, that's the peace process. Uh, notice it follows that it's a logical impossibility for the United States to be opposed to the peace process. That's a nice consequence. Uh, you, to, to prove that the United States is for peace, you don't have to do any laborious inquiry into the annoying facts, because it's true by definition. Since the peace process is whatever the United States is up to, the United States is always supporting peace. And the U.S. enemies are always opposed to peace uh, because they're not supporting what the U.S. is up to, and by definition that means uh, 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 they're opposed to peace. Uh, you'll never find in the U.S. media, or for that matter in U.S. scholarship for the most part, any such phrase as the United States is opposing the peace process or the United States is trying to block the peace process. You can't find such statements because they'd be logical contradictions. Actually, I made this statement in a talk in Seattle a couple of months ago, and there is a media analysis group in the graduate school there, and a couple of weeks later I got a letter from somebody saying he was kind of intrigued, so he did a database study of the New York Times over 10 years, and he found, I don't know, like 900 references to peace process and checked them all out, and in fact there's not one case where the United States was opposed to the peace process. It's pretty remarkable because that was a period when the United States was trying to undermine the, uh, di diplomatic negotiations and settlement in Central America and in the Middle East and so on. Notice that it's pretty remarkable. It, even the most sublime state, uh, you'd expect that it wouldn't always be in favor of the police, p peace process, maybe just by error or misunderstanding. But in the case of the United States, it's I, th I suspect it's 100 percent. You might check and see if you can find any exception. And the reason is it's just true by definition since the peace process is whatever we do. Uh, now, there are two major examples of peace processes in process now. One of them's in the Middle East and one's in Central America. There's no time to go through the details, but if you look, you'll notice that in the Middle East, the United States has been trying to block a diplomatic settlement for the of the Arab-Israeli conflict for the past 20 years, and it's still trying to block it. And in this, it's virtually isolated in world opinion. That's exactly what's going on now. Uh, if you like, I'll give you some details. I have a detailed discussion of it in the current issue of Z Magazine, if you're interested. Uh, but I think it's quite clear. Nevertheless, the discussion is the United States is trying to advance the peace process. Uh, there's another peace process going on in Central America, which is no less interesting. Uh, I'll read you from the front page of the New York Times today. Uh, the lead story in the New York Times today, which I picked up on the airplane, says U.S. Envoy urges Hondurans to let the Contras stay. Okay, let them stay in Honduras. They're trying to kick them out. And then comes a long story, and you turn to the second page, the continuation page, and it says, on its face, the administration proposal to keep the Contras in place would seem to be inconsistent with the spirit of the regional peace agreement, which calls for their relocation. But administration officials say there's no inconsistency. Well, that's about as close as you can come. You know, on its face, it seems to be inconsistent with the spirit of the peace agreement. Well, the peace agreement is quite explicit. 
uh, the 1987 peace agreement, which the United States has succeeded in undermining and destroying, says explicitly uh, that the one indispensable element in obtaining peace in the region is the end of any form of support, logistical, military, propagandistic, etc., for irregular forces like the Contras. Now, it's not it doesn't seem to be inconsistent in, with the spirit, but it's flatly inconsistent with the words uh, to keep the Contras in pra place. Uh, well, the same is true of everything else about that. Uh, the, there was a, uh, there's, uh, that was the 1987 peace agreement, which the United States tried to undermine and did undermine with the support of the media. Uh, but there are others. There's a, uh, the, right now there's a debate going on on so-called humanitarian aid to the Contras. Well, uh, the term humanitarian aid has a meaning. Uh, in fact, the World Court in its decision defines humanitarian aid. Uh, it, you look up paragraph 243 of the World Court decision, and it defines humanitarian aid as aid given for the hallowed purposes of the Red Cross, namely to relieve human suffering, uh, and crucially, it says, aid that is given without discrimination to civilians on all sides of any conflict. Only under such conditions does anything qualify as humanitarian aid. Well, that means all the stuff given as called humanitarian aid has nothing to do with humanitarian aid. It's military aid. But you'll never find this discussed in the media. I doubt if you can find one reference to this in the media. So now we're talking about humanitarian aid that's going to be voted, the Bush administration hopes, to keep the Contras in place in violation of the 1987 agreement. Well, there was also a Central American President's Agreement just last month. And that said something, too. It said the Contras have to be relocated away from Honduras. So this is flatly inconsistent with that, not the spirit, but the wording. Uh, furthermore, uh, there was a ceasefire agreement between Nicaragua and the Contras last March over the deep objections of the United States last March 23rd. And that ceasefire agreement has some very specific terms in it. It says that aid can continue to go to the Contras in... Uh, ceasefire zones, all of which are in Nicaragua, when provided by a neutral agency. That's what the wording of the agreement says. Congress passed legislation right after that sent to send what they call humanitarian aid to the Contras, but if you look at the legislation, it says specifically that it must be in accord with the ceasefire agreement and it must be in accord with the Central American Peace Agreement. Well, that means that the only aid that Congress could legally send to the, to the Contras in accordance with its own legislation is aid given by a neutral agency, like the Red Cross, uh, to Contras in ceasefire zones inside Nicaragua. Uh, that's not just my interpretation. The ceasefire agreement also specified an international official in charge of monitoring the agreement. It's the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. He wrote a letter to, President, to Secretary of State George Shultz stating that the aid that the United States was sending was inconsistent with the ceasefire agreement and he was, wanted to call the attention of the Secretary of State to this serious violation of the ceasefire agreement and the congressional legislation. That was never reported. Uh, Congress proceeded to send the aid. Uh, the neutral agency that they selected was USAID, State Department subsidiary. That's the, US, that's the neutral agency. And they're sending it illegally to Honduras. In fact, the aid that they're sending is not only incon flatly inconsistent with the Central American Peace Agreement, it's even inconsistent with Congress's own legislation. That's pretty tricky. You'll never find one word of discussion about this. This is against the background of years of the United States trying to undermine every effort at political settlement of, that, of those conflicts, whether they were uh, through the Contadora group of Latin American democracies or the United Nations or the Security Council where the United States vetoed resolutions calling on all states to support international law and so on. And it continues. But nevertheless, according to the media, uh, the press, the United States government is supporting the peace process. Well, I'm suggesting that wherever you look, if you look closely, you'll find exactly the same thing. Uh, you'll find quite a remarkable degree of civility and subordination to established power uh, particularly remarkable because there's no force behind the, there's no authority that can impose force. This is willing subservience, not compelled subservience, uh, and the kind that in fact flows, I think, just from the, the logic of the institutions for the reasons that I mentioned. Well, let me return finally to a prediction of the propaganda model that I mentioned already.
namely that however well confirmed it is, uh, it cannot be part of the discussion. It's going to, got to remain outside the spectrum of uh, debate in respectable circles, uh, maybe with some very marginal exceptions. Uh, the reasons are the ones I mentioned. They're pretty obvious. That conclusion, again, is quite well established empirically, and I think we may assume with fair degree of confidence that that will continue to be the case. Noam Chomsky will take questions from the audience later. But right now, here is some information from the Progressive magazine featuring a study by Martin Lee and Norman Solomon from the organization Fairness and Accuracy in Media. And it's about the categories of distortion from information from the establishment media. One category is loaded language. For instance, one person, one group that might be struggling for civil rights will be just engaged in civil disobedience, and the other one will be labeled as terrorists. Um, another example is that the New York Times said that uh, Moscow was going to violate the U.S.-Soviet treaty. But when it came to the Americans violating the ABM treaty, they only said that the Reagan administration was going to reinterpret the treaty. Also, they used left wing and right wing very interestingly and with a great deal of, of um, distortion. New York Times correspondents, for instance, said in about the municipal elections in Berlin, both the extreme left and the extreme right have gained in this election. Okay, who was the extreme right? Well, it was... Uh, the Republican Citizen Party, which was uh, very racist and uh, very, very right-wing. But who was the left-wing party that he was concerned about? The Greens, the little Greens, you know, the ecology pro-peace people. And so this, was the, this is the way the uh, New York Times distorts things. You know, Saharto is moderate and the Greens are leftist. And only a few of the nuttiest reactionaries are right wing, whereas one could argue that George Bush is right wing, that uh, NBC is right wing, and GE, and most of the corporations are advocating policies mm -hmm. that in an earlier age would be seen as right wing, <laughs> to the right of any moderate center that you can possibly imagine. Well, whoever is in power always usually designates themselves at the center, and anything to the other, either side of it are bad asses. Well, there's another distortion. They, of course, they throw around the word communist all the time. Uh, for people, they don't want communist or leftist or Marxist, even calling uh, the Sandinistas communist in the New York Times and the networks all the time, although they were so far from it. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, but they also talk about uh, the budding democracy in El Salvador, that lovely land of death squads. They, uh, I, I always took me to death in the Vietnam War. They say, well, uh, 50 communist troops were killed and injured today. You never hear them talk about the, uh, how many capitalist troops were killed or injured. They're always the communists. How many counter-revolutionary, <laughs> interventionist, <laughs> imperialist yeah. forces were shot? Another category of distortion in this article in the Progressive is unattributed assertions and suspicious resource, uh, sources. Uh, there were, for instance, was Dan Rather had an article in which he said, Bert Quint reports that the Palestine Liberation Organization Conference in Algiers was orchestrated by Moscow. Well, where did he get that information? Nobody said. When they tried to nail down Dan Rather on it, CBS said, well, uh, that might have been a strong word, orchestrated by uh, Moscow. Might have been ill-chosen. Well, 150 million people around me ever saw it and they didn't make a retraction. In point of fact, the networks are constantly conduits for disinformation. It's not just the CIA that plants stories like Gaddafi was going to assassinate Reagan, remember that one? But the administration are constantly feeding lies into the media that then the media broadcast, again, using this cover yeah. of unattributed uh, st sources. I found out in the research I'm doing on this book on uh, U.S. television that John McQuethy, who is the ABC defense and Pentagon reporter, has been a constant source of disinformation for years during the Reagan administration. There are so many leaks from the government 
so-called leaks, you could, so many of them you consider plants because it's just inf this information which the government wants to get into the regular media. Or they'll say, well, U.S. intelligence experts believe or CIA people think, but they don't say who it is, and uh, so you can know exactly who's pumping out this disinformation. Let's return to Noam Chomsky as he takes questions from the audience. The first one was about his opinion of PBS and the ACLU. The ACLU is an important organization. The ACLU, in fact, became the ACLU right at the time of the Red Scare, Wilson's Red Scare, and in response to that severe repression. And since then, it has a pretty admirable record of uh, it's conservative rec. It's a conservative organization, very conservative. The term conservative is another one of those that's been distorted out of any relation to its meaning. But in the real sense of the term conservative, the ACLU is a conservative organization. Uh, which is trying to p preserve basically conservative values, 18th century values, and it does a pretty good job on it. It's had bad periods. Uh, it went along with McCarthyism, for example. And it doesn't take the really hard cases. Those are taken by more militant civil rights organizations. But it has done very good things. Uh, it's a very striking fact that uh, about the political system. Uh, you recall what happened with the ACLU in the last elections. Uh, the Republicans attacked uh, Dukakis as a card-carrying member of the ACLU. That's a very interesting phrase. That means an organ. Uh, card-carrying, of course, means real, really com communist. You know, that's what it's supposed to imply. Uh, so here's an organization that's committed to the defense of the Constitution, and according to the Republicans, uh, that's communist. Well, you know, I think that characterizes modern conservatism. It's really a profoundly reactionary movement which is deeply opposed to the values that, on which the country was established. And that's why they would call a, an organization uh, calling for the defense of the Constitution a uh, subversive organization. Now, what was the Democrats' defense against this charge uh, that, they were, that Dukakis supported the Constitution? Uh, his defense was to deny that he supported it. I mean, he didn't say, yeah, of course I'm a member of the ACLU and proud of it. Uh, what he said is he gave it, they published a list of cases of the ACLUs that he disagreed with. That was the, Repu the Democratic response. Well, that tells you something about elite opinion. Uh, I, no, I don't think the ACLU is an illusion. I think it's an important organization. I'm proud to be a card-carrying member and to speak at their meetings and stuff. I also think there are more courageous organizations that take harder cases. Uh, what was the second question? Oh, yeah, public broadcasting. Well, public broadcasting is an interesting case. Uh, in a lot of countries, public broadcasting is, ten, is, I mean, how free public broadcasting is. Public broadcasting is not subject as much, at least, to business and to corporate and advertiser pressures. However, of course, it's subject to state pressures. Uh, and uh, uh, how free and independent public broadcasting is depends typically on how free the state is. Not like in a free society, public broadcasting will be free. For many years, the BBC was very independent. Uh, with Sh Thatcher, uh, another uh, anti-democratic reactionary, uh, the BBC has been, become much more constrained because uh, the British government is also imposing harsh constraints on freedom of expression under Thatcher, another mislabeled conservative. Uh, but uh, turning to the United States, public broadcasting is very weak as compared with virtually any other country, any other democratic country. You know, any of the, you look at the industrial democratic societies, they all have public broadcasting. Some of them have only public broadcasting. For example, in Israel, there's only a state TV. In England, until recently, there was only state TV, and now there's another channel, uh, two other channels. I think in Canada, if I, till recently, there was only CBC. There may be another one now, I've forgotten. Uh, but it's common. I mean, those are major channels, and that's true of most countries. And uh, how free they are depends on how free the country is. In the United States, they're very weak because here things are run by corporations. This is a business-run society, uh, and things are supposed to be under corporate control. So public broadcasting is very w limited, and in fact, it survives to a large extent on corporate donations, which is a constraint. Uh, Gulf and Western, in one famous case, forced WNET-TV in New York to cancel a program on hunger uh, simply by saying they'd remove their subvention and they had to submit. Uh, uh, and public broadcasting is, is uh, you know, it varies across the country. In the 
major centers like Boston and Washington and New York, it's very, very narrow. It's, in fact, it's, I think it's more tightly censored than corporate radio and television. Uh, in other parts of the country, like you know, Laramie, Wyoming, and Des Moines, Iowa, and maybe here, uh, it's more free. Uh, and that makes sense. The same is true of the commercial media. Uh, because in the ideological centers, it's much more important to control what people think. What they think out in the sticks doesn't matter so much because there isn't much they can do about it. Uh, and as a result, uh, it's more open. I mean, I can see that myself. If I go to Laramie, I get interviewed on public television, on public television but that's inconceiv virtually inconceivable in Boston. Uh, you know, maybe a minute now and then or something in the interest of, you know, fairness or something. But, uh, and, big, and the reason is that, you know, b b uh, the main centers like, say, Boston are subject to what's called a liberal bias, meaning tightly controlled by ideological managers who know their business and don't let things get out of hand. Uh, I think it's possible to put the kind of pressures on public broadcasting that can't be done on corporate media, but to that, that requires organization and real participation. There are other forms, I should say. Uh, one of the most, some of the most interesting and important things are listener-supported radio. Now, that's usually a small-scale operation, you know, fly-by-night operation, but they're very important. Now, that's really out of corporate control or state control. And you can tell, you travel around, as I do, to communities, uh, and the ones that have listener-supported radio are quite different. There's just an independent culture that can sustain itself there with people participating and, you know, involvement of the community. I mean, it's just much more democratic, uh, and but you can see the results. But that's, you know, very limited resources because resources lie essentially in the business community. Another way they distort it is to, when they'll have a government source that has credibility, right, the Secretary of State or somebody like that, but then when they have non-government sources or critics, they'll have somebody from a foreign government. They'll have a Russian or they'll have a, uh, uh, Ortega from Nicaragua, but they don't show the people in the United States who are progressive critics of the U.S. government. They always make it look like it's those dirty foreigners against the good old stars and stripes. So this is one way of showing. For instance, and when they do have a point-counterpoint, they got to the absurd uh, state where in the McNeil Error Program they had a thing on uh, nuclear weapons issues. And who was the dove they had? It was old Sam Nunn giving the uh, dovish point of view. In fact, Frank, uh, FAIR, that same group that uh, puts out this analysis that you're reading, has recently published a report on the McNeil Lair show where over a nine month period they documented who the spokespeople were from the different groups in, of the society on the uh, program. And they documented that it's almost primarily uh, conservative groups and spokespeople. It's corporate mm -hmm. spokespeople. It's these conservative think tanks that, doc that dominate the special guest and expert uh, segments. And there's almost no labor union people, environmentalists, public interest group people, and no one um, left the center is ever on there. Supposedly, I think it was Lair, Jim Lair, said he doesn't like uh, moaners and whiners from the left. And so he gave his uh, producers instructions not to bring any of those types uh, on the uh, program. Mm -hmm. And they did a case study, for instance, of the Exxon Valdez uh, story that during the period they were monitoring the McNeil Lair program was one of the big uh, stories. And they didn't have one environmentalist on, despite many special segments on the show, they would tend to have the governor of Alaska or an Exxon Corporation spokesperson or a congressperson, but they never um, had environmentalists on who you would think would be the experts that could really uh, assess the impact of the oil spill on the environment. Likewise, when they have a segment on uh, Central America, they rarely have people from, say, Nicaragua or the El Salvador left. They always have these right-wing um, conservative types here in the U.S. who are pontificating about Central America. And so you, you get a very narrow spectrum of opinion on our public television program. The first cousin category to what we're talking about in this progressive article uh, category is stenography or journalism. 
uh, I thought it was very interesting that the uh, there was an article in the Daily Texan where a a woman who was a journalism major she was complaining because she said that a journalism professor told her that her job is mainly to be a quotation gatherer. Well, that's apparently what's the what the news media like because they come up there and they they take down word for word all the things that these government officials have to say. Even when they're lies, they don't check them out to see if they're lies. Their statements are not co corroborated. They just quote them and put them before you on the evening news and their little sound bites, but they don't balance this by getting some of these other people on that we've been talking about, some of the other uh, uh, progressives or critics from the American uh, um, left or pro uh, progressive point of view. Another category is Kissinger-Hague disease. It seems that David Brinkley and Meet the Press, Face the Nation, Hot and uh, Nightline, they uh, seem to have those two uh, uh, Martians, we call them. Anyway, they're, they seem they love the military and all the bloodshed that they can cause. But they have Kissinger and Haig on time and time and time again. Of course, they don't tell you that Kissinger uh, has his own business, which is involved in a lot of these activities, which they're talking about on the evening news. In fact, Frank, we've given the report that Mother Jones has about what institutes, what think tanks in Washington provide the guest experts for either Ted Koppel and the public affairs discussion shows or the PBS shows. And it's almost always the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, or other of these right-wing uh, organizations and think tanks. Occasionally, you'll get the Brookings Institute, which is a very moderate centrist think tank, giving some of its experts on these programs. But you never have the Institute for Policy Studies or any of Nader's think tanks or any of the left progressive organizations giving their spokespeople, most of whom have academic credentials, who have written books, who have PhDs, who are college professors, whereas most of the people that are the soundbite experts from the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation have very minimal academic credentials. Many of them don't have PhDs. Many of them have not published major books, but they're taken as the expert because they know how to produce the sound bite, the 20-second uh, blurb that the networks are uh, looking for. Plus, they're safe. If you were the leader of the country um, on issues such as Central America and Israel, and you were the one that was making the decisions, how would you deal with the problem in the Middle East now? If I were the leader of the country, I probably wouldn't do anything very much different from anyone else, uh, no matter what I believed. And the reason is I would be under such tight constraints from real objective power that I just wouldn't have any leeway. Uh, there's good reasons for it. But so let me, instead of going into that, I go into that if you like. But instead of doing that, let me answer your first question. What, but let me take your other way of formulating it. What do I think we ought to do? Uh, uh, well, I think there are some pretty obvious answers, both in the Middle East and in, uh, at least there's a general framework for obvious answers in the Middle East and in Central America. Uh, in the Middle East, there's been a very broad international consensus on a political settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and there has been for many, many years. Uh, that consensus, for example, was expressed in a, uh, 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 a resolution that came to the UN Security Council in January 1976. That's 13 years ago. Uh, it called for um, a two-state settlement, uh, establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, a settlement on the internationally recognized borders, namely the pre-June 1967 borders, and then it just repeated the wording of UN 242, the main UN document, uh, with uh, guarantees for the independence and territorial integrity and security of every state in the region and its right to live in peace and security within recognized boundaries. And then it went on to discuss some modalities you know, for achieving this end. That's the basic framework of the international consensus. Well, that particular resolution was vetoed by the United States. Uh, Israel refused to attend the session. Uh, the resolution was initiated by the three major Arab states, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, the three confrontation states. It was supported by the PLO. In fact, it was openly supported by the PLO. According to the Israeli delegate, who's now the president of Israel, it was in fact prepared by the PLO. Notice that that 
is worth noting this because that means that already 13 years ago, uh, Arafat had gone exactly as far as he did in that famous press conference on December 14th, which was alleged by the media to have changed everything. Nothing changed. He had just repeated the same position he'd been saying for the last 13 years. Um, there's reasons why the United States changed its position, but that's different. Uh, this was, it was supported by the Soviet Union. It was supported by most of Europe. It was supported by most of the non-aligned countries. In fact, virtually by the entire world. Uh, that's why the United States had to veto it alone. Uh, well, that's, you could argue about details, but something like that is a, probably the only plausible, at least interim, settlement. If you wanted to pursue it seriously, you'd have to talk about economic relations of a federal nature between the two states and all sorts of other things and modalities to secure it and so on and so forth. But that general idea has been a very broad international consensus. For years, the United States is alone virtually, aside from Israel, in opposing it. I mean, not totally alone, like it's opposed by Gaddafi. There are rejectionists, aside from the United States. Part, there's marginal groups around the world, like Khomeini, you know, the Afghan rebels. I mean, there's a few other groups that oppose it. But primarily, it's opposed by the United States. That's why it doesn't get anywhere. Now, that has disappeared from history on the assumptions of the propaganda model. That's not part of the peace process. Why? Because the United States was opposed to it. And it's a logical impossibility that the United States should be opposed to the peace process. So therefore, that's gone from history. When the, United, when the New York Times, or any scholarly monograph for that matter, reviews the peace process, they don't include this, because this is not part of the peace process. Well, that's only one example. There are many others. Uh, and I think that's a general framework for settlement. Uh, as far as Central America is concerned, I think it's pretty obvious what ought to happen, generally speaking. I mean, the United States has carried out major crimes in Central America, really major crimes. Uh, in the 19, I mean, first of all, our whole history. Look, Central America is one of the most miserable areas of the world. And it's an area where U.S. influence has been enormous for a century. Well, at once that tells you something, you know. I mean, you don't have to think very hard to figure out what that means. Uh, and it's for reasons. There are reasons for it. You look into the details, you can find out reasons for it. Even the so-called constructive programs were actually lethal, like take the Alliance for Progress. You know, mo most of our, of the, a lot of what happened in Central America is just because we imposed dictators and gangsters and terrorists and so on if they ever try to get independent, as in Guatemala. But every once in a while there's something called a constructive program. The Alliance for Progress is the famous case. Well, you know, the Alliance for Progress was like a plague probably the worst plague that hit Central America until the Reagan administration. That's killers in a category by themselves. Uh, the Alliance for Progress, first of all, was a completely cynical operation. I mean, the Alliance for Progress was not instituted by the Kennedy administration because they suddenly discovered that there are poor people in Central America. And they knew that all along. Uh, it was initiated because they were afraid that the poor people in Central America were going to follow the Cuban model. Now, that means it began as a purely cynical operation, okay? And that showed. Uh, the Alliance for Progress was designed to impose on Latin America altogether, in fact, uh, an agro-export model. They're supposed to shift production from uh, subsistence crops to export for the benefit of U.S. agribusiness and the American market. Well, that has consequences. For example, it means that uh, farmers in Central America are expected not to produce rice and beans for them, to people locally, to eat, but asparagus and uh, broccoli and flowers for yuppie markets in the United States. Well, for one thing, that means they're not going to have anything to eat. So they've got to import food, which they import from us at high costs, which is good for American agriculture, uh, subsidized usually by the American taxpayer, now subsidized by them. Uh, sec and it also means that, and that food is not going to be equally distributed. It's going to be distributed to the rich. Uh, furthermore, the production is going to be by the rich because it takes capital inputs to produce the fancy fruits for the American market. Uh, so there's going to be landless peasants. Uh, furthermore, they're going to produce beef. Uh, in fact, every Latin Amer Central American country, beef production sh moved up rapidly under the Alliance for Progress while beef consumption reduced. And the reason is uh, that ranchers moved in, often with North American connections, drove peasants off their land, uh, um, uh, turned it into grazing lands so they could send beef to North American markets for hamburgers. 
great for agri uh, terrific for American agribusiness and for pesticide and fertilizer manufacturers and for the rich in Central America, but not very good for the people. Now, you take a look at, you look, go to your favorite economics book or Latin American studies book, and they'll tell you that the Alliance for Progress created an economic miracle. Well, you know, from a certain point of view, it did. A gross national product went up all through Central America. So did malnutrition. You know. uh, and the reason is obvious. You drive people off the land, up into the hills, uh, and you take over their land, and you produce beef for export and fancy crops. It's good for the gross national product. It just means the people starve. You know. uh, and in fact, the crisis of the 1980s is largely caused by that plague. Well, let's just take the 1980s. During the 1980s, the Reagan administration is responsible for roughly 200,000 people slaughtered. And that doesn't mean just killed. You know, that means tortured and mutilated and raped. I mean, Pol Pot style torture. That's pretty serious business. Hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of refugees, large areas of the country destroyed. All of this in an effort to block social reform in all three major countries where we were involved, in Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua. Uh, now, that's serious. Uh, what should we do? Well, the first, first thing we should do is stop torturing them. The uh, second thing we should do is pay reparations, because we owe them. Uh, and uh, after that, maybe there's some hope that they could reconstruct from the damage we've done to them. I think that's what we ought to do. Try to find anybody suggesting that in the mainstream, however. You can't express this view, uh, not because it's false, but because it's true. And if you look into it, you'll find that it's true, I think. Now, how, what should we do? I mean, let's go back. Well, what we should do, I mean, we, we are free to act. Plenty of things that we can do. And for one thing, we can just provide aid ourselves. You don't have to wait for the state to order you to provide aid. They need it badly. I mean, Nicaragua is reeling. The hurricane last October was the final blow. They're going to have mass starvation there. Now, the government, of course, is delighted, the U.S. government. They won't send them a penny because they want them to suffer as much as possible. But American citizens are much more independent. And, in fact, they've raised a lot of money. Uh, for example, there's one small Jesuit center in uh, North Carolina or Virginia or somewhere, the Quest for Peace, it's called, the, the Quixote Center. A little, I think they may have three staff members or something. Now, they've raised millions of dollars from people in the United States who are able to think for themselves, who aren't just slaves of power. Uh, and those are things that can be done. You can help people survive. And you can, after all, put pressure on, uh, on Congress, on the media, to do something about this. A lot of ways of doing that. Uh, ways, all sorts of ways, ranging from civil disobedience to writing letters to the editor to you know, a mass popular organization. You know, they're not going to put you in jail for it. In that sense, it's a very free country, which means if you don't do it, you have a lot more responsibility than if you don't do it in a place where you are afraid that you're going to be repressed. So there's no shortage of things to do. It's just a matter of willingness to do them. And the willingness to do them begins with a willingness to recognize reality. That's the hardest part. I think once you recognize reality, you won't have any more questions about what to do, because uh, it's too obvious. Uh, so the first thing to do is to recognize the reality. And that takes a little work. Uh, but once you recognize it, I think it's obvious what to do. Another category in the article in the Progressive is passive phrases glossed over euphemisms. Shows how, for instance, New York Times said that uh, um, Salvador Allende's policies in the 1972-73 era before the coup in Chile Allende's policies caused chaos, which brought in the military, kind of obscuring the fact that there's a U.S. government, uh, particularly the CIA, and U.S. corporations like IT&T, which fomented the chaos in the first place. And the notion that the chaos prompted the military of the Chilean government to move in and restore order really was rather, rather downplays and neutralizes the American role and also the brutality of the coup in which people later, uh, tens of thousands, were uh, jailed, tortured, disappeared, and just plain killed. Well, in Turkey, you know, Turkey has been in a, has had an abysmal uh, record of, on civil rights. They've tortured people, murdered people, incarcerated trade unionists, and uh, it's, it's been horrible in Turkey. But the Washington Post said that they call these controversial measures. 
and Turkey's military despot pursued a, quote, down-to-earth approach as he sought to deal with the rough and tumble of everyday politics. Rough and tumble. Murder and torture, rough and tumble. Well, the Miami Herald had an article, too, that they mentioned in this category. Uh, there was, it was headlined, Chemophobia may be as bad as chemicals, saying that the people who are trying to fight the chemicals that are in our food and, and in the air are really bad because being afraid of those good chemicals is really harmful. The woman who wrote it said that uh, the best scientific estimates, which she didn't specify, say that 99.9% .9 of carcinogens in the diet come from natural sources, which she didn't identify. She said that synthetic chemicals account for only 0.01% of the carcinogens which the Americans consume. None of this, none of this, was uh, had any uh, identification or source for any of these assertions. There's been quite a bit of this uh, talk about so-called chemophobia. Oh, really? In, in, yeah, this is, the <laughs> corporations are pushing this uh, big. The other thing that the big polluters are doing, who are producing chemicals and wastes and different things that are uh, pesticides that are poisoning the environment and our food, they're producing these PBS nature shows for their penance, penance for their crime. <laughs> and FAIR, in their latest edition of Extra, their newsletter, has a list of the biggest chemical polluters in the world and their crimes and the penance. That is the PBS uh, uh, series that they fund. So BA BASF, that's one of Europe's most energetic, toxic, dumpers, it funds the PBS program Adventure. Chevron, which is California's largest petrochemical polluter, funds the PBS program National Geographic Special. DuPont, the major chemical polluter, the world's largest producer of ozone-eating chemicals, produces discoveries underwater. <laughs> Georgia Pacific, which is a clear-cut timber and paper mill polluter, produces Forever Wild about the environment. And on and on and on through the biggest uh, polluters, their crimes, and the whole series of PBS nature programs that they produce that very rarely talk about pollution and some of the problems of these corporations destroying the environment. So this is the way they buy protection by controlling the PBS programs about nature and the wilderness and making sure that their crimes are not uh, investigated. When I graduate, I'm going to be a history teacher? History teacher. What do you suggest in the high school? Or what do you suggest I do in that context to keep yeah. from perpetuating Well, this? you know, that's really important. I mean, you know, a lot of people, I suspect many of you, if you think of your own experience, I know me, uh, you can remember cases where a teacher really made a terrific impression on you. I mean, most schooling is just train, training for stupidity and conformity. But every once in a while, and that's institutional too, there are reasons for that. But occasionally, you know, you get a spark. Uh, somebody will challenge your mind, you know, make you think, uh, encourage you to think, and so on. And that's a tremendous effect. You know, you just reach all sorts of people. Uh, of course, if you do it, you're going to be, uh, you may very well uh, have problems. Uh, you have to tread a narrow line. Uh, there are plenty of people who don't want students to think. They don't, they're afraid of the crisis of democracy. You know, people start thinking and you get all these problems I was quoting at the beginning. You know, they won't have humility enough to submit to a civil rule, you know. Or they'll start trying to press their demands in the political arena. Or they'll, you know, have ideas of their own instead of believing what they're told. And uh, privilege and power typically doesn't want that. Uh, so they can react. And a high school teacher who tries to get students to think may find uh, repression, uh, firing, and so on. You said a lot about the role of the media in a so-called de democracy. Uh, I'm wondering how you see uh, the role of our educational system, what it's doing right now, what forces are driving it, and what constraints are on it, and how should it operate? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I quoted the uh, Trilateral Commission view of the educational system, uh, namely it's a system of indoctrination of the young. And I think that's correct. It's a system of indoctrination of the young. That was the way the liberal elites regard it, and they're more or less accurate. Uh, so the educational system is supposed to train people to be uh, obedient, conformist, uh, not think too much, uh, do what you're told, 
stay passive, don't cause any crises of democracy, don't raise any questions, and so on. That's basically what the, what the uh, system is about. Uh, even the fact that the system has a lot of stupidity in it, I think, has a function. You know, it means that people are filtered out for obedience. If you can guarantee lots of stupidity in the educational system, you know, like stupid assignments and things like that, you know that the only people who will make it through are people like me and like most of you, I guess, who are willing to do it no matter how stupid it is because we'll, we want to go to the next step, you know. So you may know that this assignment is idiotic and the guy up there couldn't think his way out of a paper bag, but you'll do it anyway uh, because that's the way you get to the next class uh, and, and you want to make it and so on and so forth. Well, there are people who don't do that. You know, uh, there are people who say, I'm not going to do it, it's too ridiculous, you know. Uh, those people are called behavioral problems or uh, something like that. They end up in the principal's office or in the streets or selling drugs or whatever. And all of this is a technique for uh, selection for obedience. And I, have, I don't know how to prove this, but I have a feeling that when you go to the elite universities, you find more obedience and conformity, probably because you're getting the students who were better able to do it. You know. uh, well, all of that is functional. That's the way it works. But it, and it works right through graduate school. I mean, if you, it, there are, by the time you get to graduate school, it's already a little more varied because some real contradictions develop in the system. The problem is that you can't have progress this way. You know, now, especially in the sciences and engineering, that's a problem because the corporations need science and engineering. You know, if you don't have innovation, you're really in trouble. So they have to encourage creativity and independence because you can't get anywhere if you just copy what somebody told you. You have to be challenging things all the time, challenging everything, you know, uh, and thinking new thoughts and so on. And there you got a real contradiction. Uh, it's hard to train people to be creative and challenging and so on, and yet to ensure that somewhere else in their lives they're conformist and obedient and never think. So you have problems. That's a serious problem in Japan, incidentally. Uh, we think of Japan as this tremendous superpower, but that's very misleading. Uh, Japan, for example, is very poor in science, for example, and they're aware of it. And part of the reason is it's, such, it's, part, of the, it's part of the same thing that makes them good workers, obedient workers. It's a very obedient society, very deferential and conformist society. And one effect of that is that you, you know, there are real constraints against independent, free thinking, and you see it in the sciences very clearly. Uh, the, uh, but it's a problem here too. So there are those contradictions. When you get to graduate school, they're beginning to show up. They show up much less in the ideological subjects, because there it doesn't matter so much if people have, you know, there isn't, it, it, profits aren't made by historians having original ideas about the French Revolution, so they can have conventional ideas. And that means that the, the pressure to try to support innovation and freedom is much less, and the, profession, the pressures for conformity, on the other hand, are much greater because in the ideological subjects, it begins to be dangerous if people think the wrong thoughts. It's not so dangerous if they have new ideas about physics. Uh, so, so you get, but nevertheless, you, know, you, there's, you begin to get a little flux in the system by the time you get to graduate school. And even at lower levels, you find it. I mean, there's, you know, there are teachers who do stimulate thought, and sometimes they get away with it. And uh, all the way through, uh, you know, if, you, if people are learning things, you just, you just can't control, you can't make them just regurgitate what they heard. Now, there's a lot of pressure to turn the schools into the Marine Corps, uh, and there's a lot of support for it. Uh, for example, there's this bestseller last couple of years by Alan Bloom. Uh, that was all over the supermarkets, closing of the American mind. Yeah, which every, you know, huge bestseller, supermarket racks, which is where I read it, and things like that. Uh, well, you take a look at what he's saying, uh, and, and there was plenty, you know, a lot of enthusiastic uh, accolades for it and so on. Uh, he was saying that a couple of us smart guys will decide what the great thoughts are, uh, and every student will memorize them, and that's education. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, that's a way to turn people into pure automata. I mean, even if they happen to pick the great thoughts, uh, there is no way less likely to get anybody to think about those thoughts than to make that the curriculum. That finishes them off, you know. Uh, uh, but, uh, and I think that's the purpose, really. I mean, the purpose is just to impose authority, you know. Here's the great thoughts, all this other stuff is rubbish, just learn those and you're okay, I'll pick them, you memorize them. 
That's basically the line. Uh, now, of course, that's, that's the opposite of education. I mean, that's the way you study Talmud or something like that. Uh, but uh, it's very popular, and I think it reflects the same concern over the crisis of democracy. In fact, Alan was it Bloom himself was extremely, the incident that really got to him was a case in Cornell, where he was a professor, where some black students took over one of the, one of the buildings. And he, was, he said, that's just like the Nazis, you know, it's back to the Nazis. He has a whole business about the Nazis and so on and so forth. Well, you take a look at what happened in that. He doesn't tell you what he thought. The, and he says the faculty capitulated, you know, just like Heidegger capitulated to the Nazis and so on. Uh, what actually happened, if you look back, is that there were real grievances. Undoubtedly, the students shouldn't have done what they did and go into the building with guns and so on. But it was settled very amicably. It was settled amicably. amicably. Nobody was killed. Uh, the grievances were to some extent dealt with, and the net result was better than it was before. Well, he didn't tell you what he thought they should have done, but it's sort of implicit. I mean, uh, I guess they should have bombed the place or something like that. Uh, but uh, that's what really set him off. And in general, what set many people off was the, the you know, the, the 60s are now described in the literature as if it was a time when students were running around burning libraries and you know, destroying the foundations of civilization and so on. What was actually going on is they were asking questions. You know, they were raising questions. They were uh, looking into things that people hadn't looked into before. They were not just obedient. And from the point of view of uh, a lot of the faculty, that's equivalent to burning the buildings. You know, you can't have that small distinction. You can't make that. Uh, and uh, there's pressure to turn the schools back to the days when you didn't have to worry about those things, like disobedient students asking questions about things that you didn't tell them to think about and so on. The last category of the media con game article in the uh, Progressive by Martin Lee and Norman Solomon is the numbers racket. Of course, any of you have been in, in demonstrations or seen this before, where the media will say, oh, well, if it's somebody they don't like, then, well, it'll just be a small number, and the cops will always underestimate what the organizers and, and other people who participated in a particular thing uh, say really happened. Uh, for instance, um, there was a story in the New York Times that 15,000 Jews and Palestinians joined Jerusalem Peace Rally people who saw the peace rally and who were there said there had to be at least 35,000. The organization Peace Now uh, said this also. Uh, another way they distort, they, during the mid-80s, the State Department always kept saying, and the, the, the uh, media always just dutifully uh, re repeated their quotes, that there were between uh, 2,500 and 3,500 Cubans in Nicaragua as military personnel. And they eventually upped that up to 3,500 3, to 5,000 Cubans in uh, Nicaragua. Well, when Rafael del Pino Diaz defected to the United States in 1987, he said, no, there have only been 300 to 400 Cubans in Nicaragua. And that was the number which the Cubans and the Nicaraguans have been saying all along. A more significant way of media distortion in this numbers racket category is when they start talking about unemployment because the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases these figures, which you hear repeatedly all the time on the news, uh, but they really hide the true extent of unemployment. For instance, uh, not counted are people without jobs who haven't looked for a job in over a month because the prospects are discouraging. And they're also, they don't uh, uh, count in it people who retire early. They don't, uh, uh, they, count in the people as being employed who only worked one day a week. Now, you can't hardly live on that, but nonetheless, that counts as somebody who's employed. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually puts out another report called the U7 rate, which factors in all these other things we just mentioned, the discouraged employment, the early retirees. Um, so it's a much, gr much considerably greater, uh, more accurate figure than the one you get on the regular media. So in 1986, when the media reported the average national unemployment rate was 6.2%, the U7 rate, which the journalists ignore, was 14.3%. And that was much more accurate. But of course, that would have everybody all up in the air and excited, and they don't want to do that in this country. We've got to keep the people cool. So what's the worth of all the news you get from the media, particularly on television? British journalist named Ed Harriman says, despite the wonders of communications technology, 
The news often seems little more than folklore, a steady stream of nursery tales for adults. And that's the end of this Alternative Views. I'd like to thank Lori Lachlan, Melissa Crowley, and Michael Ferris for their editing assistance on this program. Also, Paul Lukowski and Jim Dickerson, who provided the tape with a speech of Noam Chomsky from Eau Claire, Wisconsin.